but I'm trying this for the first time. I'm very excited. I don't know if you can see it. What is this? You? Bud Light Chalada Tajin? With, with tahin. Tahin? What is oh, that? Tahin is, is this. That? Do you not have, do you, have you had a Chalada before? What is a Chalada? I have no idea what that means. Have you had a Bloody Mary before? Once a long time ago. It's not my, that was never really my thing. <clears throat> Chalada or a Michelada is like, there was a beer that was a Bloody Mary. Okay. Tomato juice, lime, chili it's powder. Like spicy. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. It's so fucking good. Like Bloody Marys, man. If I could have like my perfect breakfast, it would be Bloody Marys with bacon coming out of the top of it and like biscuits and gravy. Like <laughs> there yeah. I'm I'm good as fuck right there. Yeah. Hello everybody and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast where today I'm going to be sharing with you a conversation I had with Matthew Buckley Smith of Slee Ricketts fame. And um, we just shot the shit for a bit and recorded it. And the funny thing was, was when we first got on the call, the plan wasn't to necessarily record the conversation. And then this motherfucker starts dropping fucking wisdom bombs and shit like crazy. And um, I didn't want to interrupt him because he was on a great train of thought. And he was just going and going and going. And like right now, I can't even remember what the fuck it was he was talking about. But then um, I said, I'm like, dude, maybe we should fucking record this because you're fucking doing some shit right here. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hit record and then I start running my fucking mouth about dumbass shit. And it's the stuff you heard in the beginning. And then by the time, like, everything fucking was going, like, we never, like, hit that topic again. I can't even fucking remember what it was. I think we started to, but, like, quickly went away from it. But other things that we talk about, um, uh, the changing norms and reviews, reviewing friends' works, natural selection, the Baltimore poetry scene, Insta poetry, loneliness, MySpace, Instagram suggestions... Me being bad at math, poetry being bullshit, and phoning it in. Good lord, what a ridiculous bunch of topics that we went over. But it was really good. I love talking to Bucks, dude. He's a good fucking guy, man. And if you haven't um, listened to the Slee Ricketts show yet, wherever you listen to podcasts, look up Slee Ricketts and um, give it a listen. It's a good show. Good show. So anyway, um, I'm going to quit fucking talking and let you listen to our fucking conversation like the eavesdropper that you are i totally derailed that whole fucking thing like you were no, like no, no, saying no. all this awesome smart shit and then i'm like you know what fucking <laughs> i maybe i just think like poetry has been has been like such a like like mcdonald's ball pit for the last however many decades that it's you know like let's go ahead and throw some razor blades in there like let's go ahead and Shed a little blood and, and make things interesting. So let me ask you this. When do you think the last great decade of poetry was? And you're not allowed to say Homer. I don't necessarily think coherently about great decades. Yeah. I, I am more interested in, because I think it's something we have maybe more control over in how we talk about poetry. Yeah. So I actually had some interesting conversations at this festival with older... i wanted to ask you about that too yeah, yeah. so I, I talked to a couple of older poets about reviews and the the changing norms they came at it kind of in different ways like on the one hand one of them was saying like it's first like you can't trust reviews or judges or anyone who has given the power to actually arbitrate something or, or award something or comment on something about poetry publicly, basically saying like you can't trust any of them to be impartial. And so his conclusion from that was, don't try to be impartial. Like if you so find yourself in one of these it. positions, well, not lay into it, but like, so his concern was like, if you are a, if you're going to go join the judges or the reviewers or the whoever's, and you're going to try to be the one honest man, right? You're going to be Diogenes' mm -hmm. man. He, his his point was that's uh that's ridiculous yeah. and that accomplishes nothing like go ahead and be your biased self and the, and the, in previous generations this was often how like people often just flagrantly reviewed their friends mm -hmm. or i mean in whitman's case reviewed themselves 
uh, in Pessoa's case, reviewed themselves badly, <laughs> pretending to be other people who hated them. Uh, but I think I think like his he sort of said like we have this funny contradiction where it is all so uh, it, it it's all corrupt and it's all venal and none of it's trustworthy. But we're very precious about how we pretend it is. Mm -hmm. We talk about it as if it's very important for us to you know full disclosure. Um, you know, I once uh, uh, was in a uh, blowjob party with this like like for, full disclosure like you have to you have to disclose any link to the person you're writing about or have you know or or uh or, or you know might have a link to and and i think you know his his argument was in the past we didn't worry about that so much uh now we're still we're still lying but we're pretending that we're we're uh we're you know we're being saints about this like setting aside the whole question of like whether and an education can get you employment, which like generally speaking, no, unless you're learning an actual skill. There's this other question of like people who are people who have been uh, unfortunately encouraged to make art of a certain kind, the center of their lives. Mm -hmm. like, like that's part of what happens when you get an MFA. It's not just that you have this fake degree that doesn't mean anything and you can't really get employed with it. It's also that like you've sort of committed to like, I, I guess I'm a poet now. Mm -hmm. um, and because the, there's some people for whom the MFA is like almost a, uh, an afterthought. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, I guess, yeah, like maybe it's worth it to go ahead and do this. I've already either done way, all of this. I might right, as like, well keep going. Either way, I'm, I'm writing poetry regardless. And I've yeah. been doing this a long time. And so like, either I could get an MFA or I could not and whatever. But there are people I think who sort of, I mean, I knew people in my program who were often, smart often not without some gift but they they somebody had sort of encouraged them <laughs> you know that i felt like that wasn't very nice of you like that was like you fucked up by encouraging this person to get an mfa in poetry but like now what has he done like now he's gotten an, an mfa in poetry he's devoted this time this part of his life he's like he didn't go to law school he didn't do whatever else does he really love poetry like, would he be writing poetry on his own? Maybe a little sometimes. Yeah. Maybe instead you could have just encouraged him to read poems because it's great to read poems. Yeah. And, you know, so I think like the, there's a there's a flood not only of people who are trying and failing to get jobs. There's also this flood of people who are sort of saying like, oh, uh, I guess I'm an artist. I got to Oh, you can. So I think like all of the encouragement that we offer people who are writers, which is like, hey, you can't believe what they tell you when they reject your work. Hey, you got to keep submitting. You got to keep hustling. You got to mm -hmm. don't give up. Believe in yourself. Like that's all that like that's at once helpful encouragement and totally smoke. We're blowing up people's asses. Yeah. And like probably the proportions are such that like it's increasingly smoke up asses. <laughs> I just, the question was brought up because you were talking about how the thing you were at, people were talking about how they have to do this thing now. Have say, to do... Like, say if they have any connection to... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so um, I was just wondering, like, what spurred this having to be a thing that the people there were talking about? Oh, at, at the conference, there were two separate conversations. Oh, okay. okay. One was a conversation about, about uh, judges for a prize. The other was a conversation. So the other one was a guy who said that he had... You know, a, a poet who's a friend of his, whose work he knew uh, and and admired, but thought was like had flaws or problems. He wrote a review of it in which he praised it and also criticized it. And he in his, you know, as he said, like what I thought I was doing was offering some help to a friend to try to help help him make his writing better. And friend got and, mad. Yeah, friend never spoke to me again. Ugh. And and so I said, well, okay. So then I guess my question is like, if that's a thing to do, like if trying to help your friend be better at writing, if that's a thing worth doing, which presumably it is, then how does one do that? And mm -hmm. he said, uh, not on the page, not in print, yeah. not in public. And and that's fine, like totally. Like what, like, you know, people, we have like, particularly with things like Twitter, like we're, we're so used to like the first move being let's do this publicly. Mm -hmm. 
let's CC your boss. And like, you yeah. know, uh, like, yeah, there's a lot to be said for like taking someone aside and having, a, but is that, that do you, is that that dude's job? Well, so, but the other part of it, I think is there's also value to having a real robust, critical conversation in public. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe the problem was that these two guys were sort of too much already friends yeah. for that to be happening. But then there's someone like William Logan, who's, uh, who is an asshole, but who is also not a bad reader. Like he's a smart guy. He's very, very well read. And seldom do I read his reviews and think this is an idiot. I mean, I, really seldom. I mean, I often think like, I don't really get his taste or. I think he's tr just trying to be mean for the sake of being mean here. But usually he's saying some pretty true things about the books he's So he is he's notorious for basically uh, hatchet jobs. Mm -hmm. That every, twice a year he puts out an omnibus review in New Criterion in which he, you know, m m typically what he does is he takes up, you know, five or so very well-known and already celebrated poets and he cuts them down to size. To his credit, like he doesn't do that with unknown poets if he bothers to review a first book he always praises it because if he because he's not going to review it other yeah so i think i actually think like he has some principles but he's also gotten a reputation for his for zingers and so then he starts committing to his zingers and that that makes him more entertaining and like every poet reads him what people hate him they all read him yeah uh but it also i think makes him maybe in some ways a worse communicator like when I read his reviews, sometimes what I think is, I wish there were a way for the person this is about to read it and actually hear it. Mm -hmm. But that's never going to happen. But doesn't that always, I mean, also put him in a predicament where because this is expected of him, he has to try to outdo it? every time oh yeah well i think he i think he's gotten himself in that trap i think that's that's part of what's yeah. happened to him yeah and i also think along the way it's made his own poetry terrible Ugh. uh like i think i actually think it's taken all the teeth out of his poetry yeah um but uh but i think like the it, it would be great if it were possible for there to be and like jarell i love randall jarell i love his poetry i love his criticism he was also as mean as mean can be at times like he 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 definitely went after poets just for the sake of zingers sometimes and that's you know as entertaining as it is in retrospect it's it's not uh not all that helpful for any of the writers but i do think like there, there's it, it, i wish there were a way we could talk about this stuff more frankly and in a and in a way that acknowledged how we feel i all right so i I'll, I'll I'll frame this. I want to frame this delicately because I don't want to get myself back into trouble again. But I was talking to my wife last night, uh, and we were talking about a a deceased poet, and who's very good poet. And I said something like, "Well, you know, she was very lonely, uh, and and uh, sort of had a lot of unrequited, you know, uh, love you know, uh, that she that she wrote about, and." My wife's question for some reason was phrased as, was she not beautiful? Was she not very beautiful? And I said, ah, no, she's fine looking. She's perfectly fine looking. Like she wasn't beautiful. And she had these very like passionate feelings and wrote about them. And I think was sort of felt like was often didn't have good luck in love. And then instantly she Googled this person, looked at a photo and said, oh, I think she's beautiful. So I think I perhaps understandably felt <laughs> caught, trapped, fucked. Uh, and I think like, like without trying to get myself back into trouble with my wife, I think like my concern is that a lot of our conversation about poetry is, oh, I think she's beautiful. I think it's, I think it's beautiful. And then you have William Logan saying like, she's a dog, fuck her. She sucks. I'm glad she's dead. And you're like, Jesus Christ, William, like, what, how are you talking? Like, you can't talk like that. That's not helpful to, for anybody. And it's not helpful. But like, it, it, like, not that we need to be criticizing women's appearances. Jesus, this is a terrible analogy. But like, it would be great if we could talk about this shit honestly. Yeah. You know? I, I'm actually more, <clears throat> I'm more interested to hear what you did originally to get in trouble with your wife. That, that was what I did. 
<laughs> that was what I did. Because it was obviously a trick. It was obviously a trick to ask me whether I thought this woman was beautiful. And I was a fool for answering. Because again, she's fine. She looks fine. People look like normal people. Beautiful is an exception. Right? Yeah. Like it's a small, small number of people who are beautiful. Poets, it's pretty, like most poets are kind of goofy looking. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Whatever. I shouldn't have answered honestly. But also, I don't believe her when she said, oh, I think she's beautiful. I thought, like, uh, you don't really think she's beautiful. You think she's fine. It's she a trap. Like, yes, it's a trap. It's all a trap. There's no <laughs> hope. This is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is, I never should have engaged. I should have said, oh, I don't see beauty. I don't, I, I've never seen a picture of her. Actually, I don't, I have no idea what she looked like. Yeah. Good poet, by the way. Good poet. I'm still not naming her because I don't like, I, I want to promote her poetry, but I don't want to, yeah. You want to live in a world where we can talk freely, not about people's looks, but yeah. about how good or bad their poetry is without them getting butt hurt about it. I think it's okay if they get a little butt hurt. Like, I think that's okay. I mean, again, like my, if we're talking about like my utopia, one of the, one of the qualifications is don't read your own reviews. Yeah. Ever. Don't even read commentary. Like, don't read any commentary about your art. Well, let me ask you this too. Do you think it's also fair or not fair for critics to get butt hurt when people don't like their takes? I mean, I think it's fine for people to be like hurt about it, whatever. Like, I think, I, I, I guess, like, I don't want to say, like, it's not fine for you to feel this way. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, like, you shouldn't feel this way. You know, whatever. Just feel like, feel however you, I'm, you know, I don't want to say, like, you can't feel this or that about yeah. whatever probably still like we're never going to live in a world where like friends should be able to like brutally review each other and then everything should be cool between them but i, I just think that we don't talk in an honest way about poetry i yeah. really don't I, I i think there are a lot of good objections to any kind of golden age argument mm -hmm. but i also think like with without some sense of what you might consider good or what like what might be in the running for what counts as good it, there is a there is a sort of a slackness that I think emerges in artistic production. Like this was my feeling in Baltimore. I love Baltimore. I love the art scene in Baltimore. Thriving art scene, amazing. Tons of stuff always bubbling up and flowering there. The the problem I, I had with it was that it was like natural selection with no death. Like part of how natural selection works is it tries everything. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, well, let's try this mutation. What about this? What if you had wings? What if you had a bump on your head? What if you had the, like webbed feet? And like most of them don't work. Most of them are yeah. terrible. And like those, those lines die out. But every once in a while, you stumble into something amazing. Mm -hmm. And it really, really works. And it's the line that survives. The problem was that we had no death. Like we had no criticism, no criteria for success or failure. Everything was good. Everything was fine, which meant that everybody tried everything and everything just kept going. And at a certain point, that's not actually good for the art, I don't think. I mean, you have like a, like the opposite philosophy about all this. Well, yeah, but at the same time, like your opinion is your subjective yeah, yeah, view yeah. of what your objective art should be. Sure, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like there's no reason why you can't have that like opinion of it yeah, yeah. and who the fuck am i to tell you you can't fucking think that way <laughs> you, know? you know you're this is the uh you have out you've out uh relativity yourself or you 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 this is yeah you you're you're so tolerant i've i've you've <laughs> defeated me no but like how it's it, it's not like that like how you say like for instance, like your thing with natural selection. Now there's all these fucking things running around with wings and bumps on their heads and shit that can't fucking do anything. And they're just still alive running around creating art, you know? Yeah. And then the ones that are good aren't killing off the ones that are bad. And so it's just this big fucking pool of all sorts of shit. And how can you find the really good stuff if there's all this other crap on top of it? Yeah. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, it's like a it's like a pond that just gets completely covered in algae. Yeah. Right. And then it's just an algae pond. Like, but a, to yeah. the algae eater, that's a fucking great pond. You know? Uh true. Again, <laughs> I'm skeptical about the 
algae eater. Yeah, I mean, I'm skeptical about the the correlation between anybody's genuine pleasure and the bulk of the poetry that thrives to or that proliferates today. Yeah. Again, I think with Insta poets, I I think like that's it's not my thing but it's totally legitimate okay let me ask you this like fun no. game question okay what poets from across time mm-hmm. would have been insta poets if that technology had been around for them when they were writing oh i mean countless but <laughs> we don't remember them if they weren't any good like but you don't think there's not, any no. good poets out there from like the last hundred years who would I mean, have saw there, Instagram good... as like Oh yeah. I mean, I think there are plenty of poets who would have found Twitter or Instagram to be compelling venues for some of their writing, but I don't know that they would be defined. I mean, like they wouldn't be classified as the same as the affirmation poetry. I mean, yeah, like, well, I just think, like, there. if there's a poet we really remember from the past, in most cases, there's something there. Doesn't always mean it's, like, doesn't mean that there weren't good poets who were also forgotten. Good poets get forgotten all the time. Mm-hmm. But, like, poets who get remembered, there tends to be something of some substance there. Like, it's just hard for the selection mechanism to keep that person in our minds generation after generation if there's not some meat on the bone Mm -hmm. and i think for them like maybe some of them would have had fun playing with instagram or twitter but i don't know that any of them would have been defined by the medium the way someone like ruby cover is the most dangerous poet in america most dangerous but what the most banned poet in america right (laughs) but see that's i think so the way i read that the way i read that was like when in like 1996 or whatever the statistic was like hey did you know that uh, the honda accord is the most stolen car in america it was like well it was the most common car in america exactly so i think like that's the deal with ruby Cover. It, it's like that whole thing like um white cars are more likely to get pulled over than any other color <laughs> because most of the cars that get pulled over are white but most right. cars are white but the yeah my old uh, boss yeah strange interesting oh, okay. lady yeah yeah she she was it was like the the last time i saw her you know leaving she she had this sort of like a you know uh sudden monologue she gave about how uh because two of us were leaving that year um and she's like she'd had a lot of different jobs and she'd like were you know seen a lot of people come through that particular job and she said it was really it was really remarkable how you could spend you know hours and hours and hours all day five days a week with these people and then uh, and then you just never see them again. Mm-hmm. Like then it's just cut off and, and you're just out of their lives. Uh, and that was true. I mean, there was like, I think in the moment we kind of protested and we were like, keep in touch. It was like, no, yeah. that's like, she's completely right. And it is a really weird thing. This reminds me of something. I saw um, an interview today with the Surgeon General and mm. his big thing he's pushing right now that he thinks is like the biggest health threat in America is loneliness. Yeah. And have you heard about this? Did you read this I've thing? Heard, I've heard of it. Oh, I've heard the headline. And so I actually want to hear you fill me in. Yeah, 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 yeah. His study that he's been doing over the last however many years said one in two Americans struggle with loneliness. So 50%. And that that number over the last like um, three or four decades has been like growing and growing and growing and the two things that he said were causes of this were one people's um putting more time and thought into getting a larger quantity of friends online or social Mm -hmm. interactions online than actual people you interact with and the second thing was the lockdown and covid and a bunch of people losing their jobs and now being like forced into isolation kind of thing and some of the things he was talking about to fix this was building um 
more city infrastructure to make towns more walkable so people can do more together and then putting together like i don't know if he meant events or what but putting together things in places to get people to interact with one another i mean it's, yeah I, I don't i don't think i could object to anything there i'm always skeptical of top-down solutions to these kind of problems but mm -hmm. all of all of those things seem to be good right mm -hmm. like walkable towns and events and public for people to meet one another good my, luck my yeah seriously because like it's gonna be like a city by city thing like you can't have like a fix-all solution to yeah, especially yeah, yeah. like a walkable city you know or right. a walkable town which, which is not just a matter of like having sidewalks like it's a mm -hmm. matter of like things being built. there to walk to right yeah yeah a certain proximity to one but the thing yeah. that made me kind of trip out a little bit on this was i was thinking about it and do you remember myspace days yes. were you were you ever a myspacer i was very i mean very early on and then not very enthusiastically but yeah yeah i, I mean I, I remember like when i mean i was in college when facebook came out and so it was, yeah you know shortly before that and... like the thing i liked about myspace was that the city search like function was like like in your bio it said like where you lived mm. kind of thing and i know facebook gives you the ability to do that if you want to do that right you know but um like i was thinking about it and the friends i made on myspace i'm still friends with whereas oh. like new friends i make on facebook i'm i mean i don't make new friends on facebook but like on instagram and twitter like i i don't know those fucking people Right. And I was wondering if there was a way to make the search feature or the suggested, because you get suggested people all the fucking time. Yeah. If they put something in the back end of that to where the people that you are suggested are local to you. Right. Like if that would do something. Yeah. I mean, that seems, it seems like that would be not bad like particularly if they were you know if this is the, 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 the fancy algorithm if it was not just suggesting people who happen to be close to you but suggesting people that it, that might have some other like similar interests some other links some similar yeah, interests or, or know some people in common or something you know and and also be close to you i mean all, that seems pretty reasonable i'm sure there are lots of people who could come up with nightmare scenarios for why you shouldn't do that but for real yeah, I think that's that seems good. Would that 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 whole thing just freaked me out because like I just did the thing about the twenty percent of poets yeah. and all that other shit, and now this is like such a staggering number because like he yeah. said like people when interviewed people didn't say I'm lonely. They said stuff like, um. I feel like I'm on my own with this. I feel the burden of all of this on me sure, and I yeah. have no one to share it with. It's like, yeah. that's a fucking huge number. So like, I'm really curious to see. I just feel like the COVID numbers are, have fucked everything up to where statistics aren't going to fucking work right for the next, however many fucking years. But I'm really curious to see like what suicide rates are. Like I saw an article, I saw a headline the other day that said something about the surprising effect of lockdown on suicide rates, which I suspect means that they went down. But I also don't know. I at least at least like my I mean that that's counterintuitive, and my my vague recollection of statistics from high school uh, makes me think that there's some major uh, conflating factors, like you know, uh, we forget that a large number of people who kill themselves are elderly. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if those, if they're all being wiped out anyway, yeah, then you're, you're going to lose some numbers there in a way that that could really throw things off. And we, just, we, we, we think of suicide as being people in the prime of their lives who have a, you know, a serious mental illness or, or, or are artists or something. And, that, and there, there is plenty of that, but, but it is, I think like most People who kill themselves, I believe, are 
are like elderly men. So do, do those numbers sound real to you? 50%? I, well, I, I just think like any, it's hard to know what that means. Mm -hmm. like, again, I think like all, a lot of these kind of, and, and I, you know, we don't have to get into it here, but I did just because you did mention the conversation we were having the, the Dr. Ludwig statistics are yeah. not correct. Yeah. So it's not 50, it's not 20% of poets who kill themselves. Like he, like he was talking about his own particular sample that he had chosen and God knows how he chose them. But he said there were eminent poets and of them 20% killed themselves. He also said of the professions, you know, define, I'm not sure how he's defining profession if poet counts as profession. Yeah. Uh, but like among the professions, he, you know, uh, it was a 4% suicide rate which is also insanely high. Yeah. Insanely high. And then and then he said among the general population the rate was 1%, which also is way 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 high. I mean, like that's not not even close to 1% of the population kills themselves. Yeah. So what I think was most troubling about that article, well, yes, I think poets do kill themselves more frequently than other artists and other people and the malcolm gladwell so the malcolm gladwell piece i think that maybe was maybe part of what was confusing is it seemed to confirm the dr ludwig statistic mm -hmm. what his piece said was that poets are five times more likely to kill themselves okay. that doesn't mean that it's 20 percent of poets who kill themselves yeah that just means that like if 0.012 percent of the population kills themselves then 0.6% of the population, 0.6% of the, you know, poet population killed themselves. But like, right? well, the two things about that is, is that he probably got that number from that study. And that study was just about popular, successful poets. Well, he didn't get it from that study. If I mean, because if he did it, the, if he got it from that study, then he would say poets are 20 times more likely to kill themselves. Oh, okay, so the 1%. 1%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think he, I mean, I, 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 Malcolm Gladwell has plenty of flaws and, and he's irritated me plenty, but I, I don't think he, the doctor, like the New York Times had no business running that piece from Dr. Ludwig. Like they're just like basic fact checking. It was like, I, I don't know where he was getting these numbers, but he, it's definitely not true that 20% of poets kill themselves. And I think too, the headline of it kind of made it seem a little grimmer than the article may have been getting at i don't fucking know yeah i i mean what but see where what i was glad for and this is where i think i'm i don't want to i don't want to suddenly sound like i'm like a like a i'm like a suddenly i'm like an intellectual dark web guy I'm like well, the marketplace of ideas really where it, like that's this is definitely not what i want to say but like even though i think that stati statistic was wrong i appreciated your approach to the whole question in your episode which as I've said elsewhere, is like you're you're a for being as like <laughs> gruff and and like angry as you can be sometimes, you are really like a, a mama bear. Like you're a very gentle, like like th therapeutic presence for your listeners. And your approach to this was, hey, this is terrible news. This is this is a crisis. How can we think about this in terms of what will be better for uh, us and each other? And and I like I was really grateful for that, even if the statistic that maybe don't doesn't it prove it inaccurate, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Like, like it's still a worthwhile response, and then th like valuable things come out of it. In the same way, like in you know Brian and I had our our dumb conversation, and he threw out you know oh well I, you know this mostly happens in Florida, which I think was like kind of a joke, but yeah. But then I, I was glad that like you heard that, and you said like well let's look that up like let's figure out what is happening like where are books being banned and then you had this i think pretty richly researched episode about book banning and what's actually happening with it uh so i you know i i again like i think there's some value to be found in in advocacy and in, in even like sometimes adversarial conversations because mm -hmm. you you're gonna see you're going to see the points that serve your interest better than other people will. And, and it's good to bring those points to the conversation. Yeah. 
I think with the depression or suicide thing is just that I don't think I know a single poet who does not suffer from some sort of depression or something along those lines. Oh, same here. I mean, it's totally same here. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's like, there. it's not even a question. It's not even like, oh, well, you know, there is so-and-so. Well, like, I think Amit Majumdar I don't may know not it. be depressed. Yeah. Oh, like, Amit Majumdar may not be depressed. Yeah. Yeah, over, I mean, overwhelmingly. Like the people I know who yeah. are poets are, are neurotic weirdos, are, are, you know, paranoid, are uh, self-loathing, are anxious. Like, yeah, all of these things are, are, are true. And so regardless of the statistics, it's, it's a valuable thing to then bring up and think about and try to address. Yeah. Right. Cause it is so relevant to so many. Super topics. relevant. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing is, is that I just recorded an episode that probably won't come out for like another week about people who kind of fall out of love with poetry. Oh, and okay. What I'm super interested in that. Yeah. And like what, what causes that and what to do when that happens and kind of like cause and correlation. And I was just like, Oh, I hope this is fucking helpful <laughs> because what I fucking hate is when people stop writing poetry for whatever fucking reason, but in their head, they say, Oh, I just don't have it anymore. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like there's something wrong with me because I can't do this now. I used to do this and I used to do it well, and now I just can't. Mm -hmm. So I'm done. I'm out of ideas. I can't, there's nothing left in me. And most right. of the people who do that are also like, I haven't read a book of poetry in a fucking year right. or two, yeah, you know? Yeah. That, and that has happened to, I mean, that's happened to a lot of different people who've sort of said, like, I, you know, you know, Larkin said famously that his muse had left him to stop mm -hmm. writing poetry for the last decade or so of his life i i'm in some ways i'm more interested in the people who give up on poetry not because they they say oh i used to have it and now i don't but like because some creeping suspicion has has poked its head through and and they end up saying like yeah this is bullshit it was always bullshit yeah like that to me is a fascinating uh case is that the same lines of like imposter syndrome that you guys were talking about the other day uh, or not quite kind of i mean it's it's less like imposter syndrome than like imposter the syndrome like it's like being an imposter like being like i'm fascinated by frauds and the way they and how they talk to themselves you know uh-huh uh like there because almost always there's there's some lie like bernie madoff you know when he first started fucking with the books he he what he told himself he was doing was giving himself time to make back some money he lost yeah so and are you are you saying yeah. when you say poetry is bullshit and it's always been bullshit are you talking about the act of creating poetry or the poetry community or industry I think I kind of think I mean all of it. Like I think I mean this is more or less what Joanna, what happened to her. Mm -hmm. Like she wrote poetry that people liked. She read poetry. She was friends with lots of poets. She married one. Uh, and then at a certain point, and then point, you killed them. <laughs> at a certain point, she said, "Like, I mean, it, and again, I think you're right. Like it, what really seemed to." feed it was this the the experience of reading a lot of poetry that she just thought sucked yeah and and see like seeing a lot of shitty poetry praised oh yeah spending time around poets who felt like they were bullshitting all the time you you might almost say that they were saying oh i think she's beautiful but i like they're there, like there was there was like there was a dishonesty to it and i think she just said this is bullshit and like maybe it kind of like it, like with the way she talks about it now is not like oh i could write poems then but i lost it and now i do this other thing mm -hmm. it she's uh, the way she talks about it now is good riddance yeah like thank god i'm free of that like like the way people who used to belong to a cult 
talk about it. But in doing it like that, is she like pigeonholing herself into never doing it again off of principle? If the I mean, muse I returned, she, I think she probably will never do it again. But not, but but she because she's doing other stuff. Like she writes a lot. Yeah, she writes a lot. She just writes fiction. But yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm always interested in, in like distance between the moment when you think uh, something funny here. Never mind. I'm gonna keep going on like it's not. Uh-huh. And the moment when you say like, oh, actually, yeah, I was in denial all that time. Well, then let me ask you this: Can you tell like? Say there's a poet you know that has been around for a long time. Can you tell the point in their writing when they were like, oh, shit, maybe uh, I'll just keep going? I mean, I can certainly identify with some poets that there are books, you know, after which you say like, well, it seems like you're just kind of writing poems to write poems here. Like just phoning it in, you know? Yeah, but I don't know if that's, I guess like I've, I've known enough poets that where i don't know that they think they're phoning it in like i I think and and i also don't think it quite like i'm terrified by the idea that like writers just get worse Mm -hmm. i think they often get worse but i think sometimes it's it's because of a kind of carelessness or negligence see i think it's more of not being introduced to new experiences but I think that 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 can be part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you're 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 right. I think I think there is a necessary like chemical reaction that needs like does like things need to be in motion. Things need to be changing. But I do think that there are like it's it's possible for poets to get too. It's not just about being too comfortable. Like you you have too much money. It, it's about being like n- there's no friction. There's no there's no like sparks being thrown in yeah. the in like whatever leads you to the process of writing. Like in your mm-hmm. uh in an observation a friend made recently was like, you know, what often happens is you just end up you end up sort of isolated and then you're just sort of in your study writing and you're not you're not out like having your heart broken. You're not out in yeah. the world with people. <clears throat> and so you end up having It's a rut. Like when you yeah. get into the thing where you're doing the exact same thing every day, like how are you supposed to like see something new, see the world a different way? My hope is that it's possible not just to steadily get worse. And maybe never being successful will be that will be the like that's the secret. <laughs> it's like like never get comfortable because you because you never uh you never find the one thing that works and stick to it because nothing ever works. Honestly, like every six months, you should just move that bookcase behind you to a different wall. And then you're in a different spot. You're in a different thing. You're like, and you're looking around right now. Where the fuck am I going to put this bookcase? <laughs> yeah, it's not, we don't have that many walls. Uh... That was the amount of the conversation that I'm going to let you listen to. Um, We talked for like another hour, probably. Um, I think it was about that. Um, So editing this has been quite the bitch. I'm not going to fucking lie. But comes with the territory. So I hope you enjoyed that. Make sure to download your copy of The Blood Rag over at my website, IHateMattWall.com slash the dash blood dash rag or you could just click blood rag in the thing um to get uh all 11 of the issues that are up now this issue has tim johnson mark rennie michael lee johnson bunny wild rich boucher chasey delaney me and r clark great issue awesome 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 you can run over to my etsy shop and pick up me as an action figure which is selling like warm cakes not hot cakes, but warm cakes. And then, for those of you who are excited to see the new um, chapbook for this month, that's a split chapbook with me and Bunny Wild, this is what the book looks like on the inside. The cardstock isn't here yet. It actually just got delivered. I haven't gone down to pick it up yet. But as soon as I pick it up, I'm going to print these out, and these motherfuckers will be up and available. But first, no, not first, we're at the end of the fucking show now. We're in the butt plug territory now. So I want to um, do all the shout outs. I want to give a big thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. Michael, Cedar, Harry, thank you guys. 
over at the YouTube Thank You Crew. I want to give a thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia. You guys are awesome. And then for the big swinging dicks in the Anarchy Crew, I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Minnie, to Thomas, to Tim J, to Shaylin, to Chill Baby, to Tamara, to Adam, to JH, to Chase, and to Tim G. You guys are the shit. Thank you guys. And for the burgest of all the thank yous, it goes over to the number one chappy over there in the Chapbook of the Month Club, Caitlin. Thank you. And um, yeah, if you would like to join the Anarchy Crew, run over to my YouTube page and click the fucking join button. And then you can pick shit. And um, I guess that's pretty much it. So, God damn it, keep buying my books, type hard, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.